Uh, shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 21st of the 11th month. Oh, I'm sorry. 21st of the 12th month. Please forgive me. Which happens to, to line up with the uh, 2nd of March here on the Gregorian calendar for 2024. And we're taking a little segue here. And we're going to be covering something that many people may not be aware of, but this is the record or the recording of the flight of the daughter of Zadik Yahu and how she was taken from Egypt or Mitzrayim, right, by Yeremi Yahu and transported first to Carthage, then to Rome, and then to Spain, and finally to Ireland where she was to marry the largest landholder there, the Hermon, which happened to be the uh, chief son of the sons of Zerah of Yahuda that was there, and continue the line of Dawid over the children as given in the perpetual covenant to him. But there's a lot of foretellings and very interesting things in this book. We're going to look at just a few. Perhaps it'll pique your interest to check them out. This is chapter one, and this is Taffy, which her, her name meant to be little, right? The, the little one. And um, one of the, I don't know if we'll get to it right here, but as you read this, you'll notice that when she was taken to Ireland, she had the dress and the jewelry on that looked like a sunburst with the crescent moon. So it looked like the crescent moon was coming with the sun, uh, with the, um, I'm sorry, not the it was preceding it because it was the waning crescent. And that was just like the foretelling, if you recall, about the moon being like the kingdom of the Shemaim. And you have in the genealogy of our Mashiach, where it says 14 generations from Abraham to Dawid, where you had from like the crescent moon to the full moon. And then 14 generations from Dawid to the captivity which would have been the waning crescent, which is exactly what you see in her coming to Ireland, which is some amazing stuff. You cannot make this up. You can't just fake it and have writings from different places at different times, all talking about these same things without one Ruach being the responsible party. That's odd willing. You can see all that from the things that you we were sharing here. This is Taffy, born in the house of the High Ones, princes of Zion. Zion loved of Yahuwah, home of the house of Ar-El. Daughter of Dawid, shepherd in Yahuda, tribe of the Lion. Queen over Bethel, that's the house of El, right, or Ephraim. And Dan, where they be scattered abroad. Ireland and England, right? Is not the word made sure? We are spread forth in alien places. Fire that was kindled in wrath burns to the uttermost hell. If you remember, because of what the children did in the wilderness, in Deuteronomy, Yahuwah said that he was going to take their children, kick them out of the land, scatter them across the nations. And this was the fulfillment of that. So she is pointing that out. And you'll see quite a few times throughout this book where they're quoting scriptures or explaining how foretellings are being played out with them, which is pretty interesting in itself. Cry in the night, O Yahuda, your wise men covered their faces. How for the young or your young lion slain, princes led captive to Bel or confusion. I, even I am left to cry from the uttermost region, far and the, uh, the uttermost regions of the West, which was Ireland at the time. Far off isles of the West, home of the remnant of Dan. This is stating as fact things that they knew, but there's other evidences that prove these things in history. 
So there's multiple witnesses, which is what we are required to have, that attest to these things. That Dan left beforehand was known during the time of Deborah, during the time of Judges, contemporary with the fall of Troy around 1200s BC. He was already working with Greeks and Phoenicians, if you will, paganized Hebrews that left Egypt beforehand, but picked up the mystery religions and the errors of Babel. Okay, there is um, a lot of mixture going on. And one big thing, like I'll just pull the cat out of the bag here for you guys, because I don't, I'm not good with that stuff anyways. When you start really getting your a grip on the history, and you you think about how things are and what they what they are, the culmination of all the paganism today is in Catholicism, and the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop does an amazing job of showing how literally everything that they hold to was coming straight from different pagan practices and things that were picked up from the mystery religions all coming from Babylon and stemming from that, right? So the the how it happened is actually in the histories that you can read in some of these things, which is kind of sad, but it is available for people. Um, back on point, this is sown as a thistle on earth is Yaakov. The names of us, legion, nations, kings of nations, and nations would come from them, right? Tongue of the Hebrew fails, shall not be spoken of man. Yitzhak is plowed in his furrows before Yahuwah in this season. Water the tender plant, twig of the loftiest shoot. That's a part of the... Oh, how the cedars left bare. In its burrows was corruption and treason. In Yehezkiel or Ezekiel, he talks about the foretelling with the uh, the eagles. And then right afterwards, how he's going to pluck the tender twig off the loftiest branch and take it and plant it on the mountain height of Yisrael. That was what this was about. Foretelling Tataphys being brought to Ireland. It says, crown of it bended to Baal, serpents devouring its root. Rest for the flock of Yahuwah was not found in the shade of the cedar. The cedars, if you remember, are like the elders or the, those who take counsel. Etz is a tree and Etza is counsel in Hebrew. The cedars of Lebanon were the tall, the elders that were the ones that were the counsel of the community as um, expounded on and explained in the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> it says, broken it lies, it burns, yea, as a thorn beneath a pot. Kindlings are seething therein, shot down by the archers of Kedar, meaning the Babylon, Kedar, and those that were with them, right? Foemen are warned thereby. Fire of its furnace is hot. Children of Edom dance, yea, leap in the place which is set apart. Bethlehem, or Bethlehem, bows in chains, trodden as clay in the mire. The house of bread, clay in the mire, and there's, we are the clay, he is the potter, the clay and the iron toes are also another thing that's reminiscent of something we'll see here a little bit later if we get to it with the foretelling of Julius, who's the patriarch of the Julius line family of Rome where the Caesars came from, if you, if you remember. But this is how are our walls broken down, that the pride of our mighty is lowly, yea, we wander mid stones. Deserts of thistle and briar. I that am old was young, but my heart ran down into water, hearing battle and strife, terror that rises by night. Princes and warriors stricken, fallen like sheep unto slaughter. Women's wails in the streets, outside the clamor of fight. How the nobles fallen, yea, they were strong. They were ruddy. 
fat with the firstlings of flocks, strong with the strength of the vine. Now they are white with famine. Their garments are purple, or their garments of purple are bloody. Meat is the flesh of the child, blood of our people is wine. And if you remember the curses of the covenant in Deuteronomy was that the tender-hearted woman would eat her own child, right? And the tender-hearted man would eat, consume his own children. And during the sieges of both Babylon and Rome of Yerushalayim, that very phenomenon is recorded. You have it in Chronicles and Kings during the time of Babylon, and it's recorded in the War of the Yahudim, from Josephus, from the time of Rome. This is blood of our people, and this is why, because we reap what we sow, okay? As we were, well, I don't want to get into too much detail, but as we do presumptuously to his children, which we are, right? It is done to your children as a type of that, so you can see what it is. And if you remember, these people were doing things like worshiping Kronos. So enough said with that. Uh, these were as water spilled on the ground before Nebuchadnezzar. Drops that the dogs licked up, have they not gathered and fled? Leaving the women and babes, Kazdim should slaughter at pleasure. I that was babe of the king's trembled alone by my bed. Yet one came thither unchid, to the place of the women he passed, feared of the king and hated. His hour had come at the last. In the room of the sire, the foreteller, the prisoner none might heed, came through the wasted harvest to gather the chosen seed. Sternly he bade me to follow. I dared not look in his face. As he led me by secret ways to a cave beneath the set-apart place. And the tunnels that lead to it, Ron White, he postulated they were there, but he didn't actually find it when he was um, trying to find a way in. He went the wrong way. But after he found the place, he did find the tunnels and how it leads to uh, back into the city. So they went by secret ways to the cave beneath the, the set-apart place, which was Mount Moriah, or Golgotha, the, the uh, Mount of Olives, if you will. But Golgotha was the place where he was impaled. And if you're not familiar, Ron Wyatt discovered the Ark of the Covenant January 6, 1982, north of the city, underground. And this is that very place where it was found. Says here was my one sure hold, and I dreaded it not for the dark, but I knew the fear of Yahuwah. I knew that his set apart ark was near, and I trembled for these, and I ate the water and bread of affliction. Full three days therein I dwelt as the dead. Something that we are to do as believers in a memorial of him as well. Interesting phenomenon there. Till I heard the voice of Baruch smite from the opened roof, the foe is gone from the gates, and the path of our way made smooth. Then forth in the veil of smoke from the ashes wherein she weeps, we pass through the walls of Zion, her palaces fallen in heaps. Look, cry aloud, for she slumbers, Dreaming a dream that awakes not. Weep, tear thy garments in shame, ashes and dust on your head. Yea, though the wilderness howl, yet the voice of Yarushalayim speaks not. Mourn for her exiles, mourn. None break the rest, or none break the rest of her dead. Where is the house of Yahuwah? Desolation and mourning and sorrow. Where is the place of the king, torrent gash, sun-scorched and brown? River of rocks, burnt bones, 
There the lizard shall see him the morrow. Scorpions find them a place. Conies, rock badgers, okay, make nests for their own. All right, and then we'll do number two here, and then we might skip around because there's other parts that have foretelling that I'd like to get to before we run out of time. If you have any questions or anything, don't hesitate to ask, though. Yeah. So it says, My children remember Zion. Moreover, I bid you to mark that the word of Yahuwah is Kadosh, though his purpose therein be dark. You know how we came unto mitzvah, and trusted in Shalom to dwell with the servant of El that was slain there, Gadal Yahu. If you read the accounts of what happened during the Babylonian captivity with the people that remained and who was in charge of getting killed, their migration to Egypt and everything, this is what that's talking about. Okay. There is a second witness in the scriptures that tell you the same thing. <clears throat> this is. With the servant of El that was slain there, it needs not of this to tell, but of this my sons take heed. Shall not your hearts comprehend how the foreteller of Zion prayed that our steps might be stayed in the land? Shall you not read in his book of the hope of our rest undone, of Yishmael's fraud, and of the tumult and flight? and of Shuf, Shufan's son, and how we went into Mitzrayim, or Egypt. Nay, Yahusuf shall long be blind. That's Yahusuf, the northern kingdom. Okay, specifically Ephraim and Manasseh. And that goes along with the foretellings about leading the blind in the, in the way, which was foretelling the Reformation where they didn't have his name, they didn't keep the feasts, but they had his character, they had his love, and they were learning the truth. Um, that was this time of leading the blind in the way. This is, Nay, Yahusuf shall long be blind, an ox that sleeps at midnight, and Yahuda crouched as a hind. The lion has fled from his lair, the ox has wandered astray. Now, so Yahuda is like a deer running, and if you remember, they're in captivity. They're actually under the thumb of Rome, and they've had to leave every place they've been persecuted from here to there in captivity since that time. It's, it's all history. You can actually look at that. But this is foretelling it before it happened. The lion has fled from his lair. The ox has wandered astray. Till the dawn of the east be red, and the night of the north be gray, meaning starting to dawn, okay? In the night shall no man know them, meaning lost sheep, hidden. The fishers of men went, and then we lost who they were, and then the hunters searched for them, which was also foretold. And for the hunters, just so you know, in the 1800s, there was massive amounts of hunting all over the world, archaeology, ethnology, you name it, people were doing it. And it was predominantly the people that were giving the good news to the nations that were looking for the lost tribes, not realizing that they were part of them, right? It says, in the night shall no man know them or the signs that be left to show. We'll get into that later, but if you look at the time of Judges, when you had the three on the other side of the water, they set up an altar to remember where they came from, but not to offer on it. And that was just like Ephraim, Reuben, and Gad on the other side of the waters here in the western part of the world. Um, Canada, Reuben, America, Menashe, and the, uh, the half-tribe of Menashe, and then Gad, South America, right? Um they have that same phenomenon where separated and they have emblems or they're literally the emblems of our country pointing out who we are. But again, it's hidden and most people are, they think it's like Freemason stuff because 
Satanists spin that lie to get people not to look at it. But moving on, it says, Where the shepherd keeps the ox while the lion is crouched full low, not by the banks of Yarden, not on the Kodesh hill, are Ephraim's feet, till his furrows be plowed unto Yahuwah's will. And this is the key. When it talks about he will not return in enmity in Hosea, he's talking to Ephraim. The Commonwealth of Britain and all those nations that generally, right, the, the nation and company of nations is Ephraim. When they repent, when they turn back to him, to his will, in truth, that's when things will change. I haven't seen it where it's anywhere else that specific, but it is given to Ephraim twice. That's generally what we call Britain and the Commonwealth, right? The Meloha Goyim was the fullness of the nations coming in, was the company of nations that became the British Empire. Literally, a company of nations is what they were called. But um, this is also considering Menashe being America is that remnant that went off to keep his will when no one else would. And that has its own little foretelling, the dove in the wilderness, and, and a lot of things both in Revelation and elsewhere, that a lot of people we just, we don't know because we haven't learned history and we haven't had actual truth being taught about how these foretellings were fulfilled in it. It says, Bethlehem's field is empty. The shepherd follows astray. Hear you my words, O my sons, for the isles shall await the day. Taffy, I was but weak, a little thing in men's eyes, a tender twig of the cedar, yet sheltered of prophesies or foretellings. The foreteller of El revealed this. Is not his speech made plain? He came to root and destroy. He went forth to plant again. In our fields he found no vineyard. On our pastures a wasted soil. No place for shade of cedars. No depth of earth for oil. Till the land be fed by the goyim. And the tale of their slaughters told. The days shall be slowly numbered. And the hope of the hills wax old. I was led as a slave into Egypt, as a captive to Pharaoh's hand. For the will of the son of Kera rested still on our band. But the heart of Pharaoh was softened. He gave us a resting place. As daughters we stood before him, and the foreteller of El found grace. To lead us unto Tafanes, henceforth amongst men to be, Yahudia or the uh, county of Yahud, Yahuda, right? House of the daughter of Yahuda, mindful of me. So he actually gave it to her as a place to stay while she was there and adopted her as a daughter, just so you know. It was not an uncommon thing for monarchs to do, for other monarchs of other countries. You see the Egyptian pharaoh taking the son of Edom in the same way, and... Uh, Jeroboam before he became the king over the uh, ten tribes. This is unto the ending of days. Therein a space was our rest till Baruch the scribe found tidings out of the isles of the west. That the ways unto Tarshish were open, the ships of Yawin afar, that's Greece, right? And the vessels of Tyre went forth on the left of the Racklin star. Racklin means merchant. Heraclem, Heraclem is the merchants. And that's where we get the Heracles uh, or the sons of Heracles, the, the sons of Hercules. It's originally in Greek, Heracles, like Heraclem. And it, it was just the sons of the merchants, but they didn't know that. And you can see right here, merchants, okay? It says, from the tongue of the sea to Malkaf's porch of the setting sun, 
whence northward and west they sailed till the island of towers was won. On its right hand, Bregan and Eber, the Bregani were a Celtic group, and Eber was the name for Spain. Right? On its left, that the water whose bound is the promise of El, wherein his purpose shall yet be found. So the Bregan and Eber were on the right hand, meaning inland, and then to the left was the Atlantic Ocean, which led to the Isles and eventually America, where his purpose was yet to be found, right? Then the foreteller foretold greatly of wrath and woe to come upon Mitzrayim's king and people and all that made Cush their home, Ethiopia. Weak and poor shall it be, three kings shall come from the east, Nimrod, Madai, and Elam, to break down the sacred beast. That's Nimrod was the king of Babel. The Babylonians were of the sons of Nimrod and Shem, if you didn't know that, right? But his the leader was from that line. And then Madai and Elam is what we'd call Persia. But the Elam was broken up as a people, and it was Persians that came to prominence later as part of them. It says, Yawin and Chittim thereafter, from the isles shall issue forth. That was Greece and the Chittim. That would be uh, the Greece and Rome, right? To rule the rivers of Egypt and bear their spoils to the north. And then uh, this actually doesn't have that copy on here, so I'm so sorry. I don't know why this version doesn't have it. I do have a PDF version on my phone that has the whole thing, and we've shared that on the Telegram. So I will, I, I will share that one, and I have to get that one on my computer. But real quick, I just want to finish reading this part, and then we can move on because it's just this page that's locked, I believe. Yeah. So page 11. It says, Terusi and Rouni shall reign over these with an iron yoke. The Terusi are the Etruscans, the Tyranians, and the other Hebrews from Tyr and Zidon that went over to Italy, the north of it, that also amalgamated with the Latinum people and the uh the Romans, the, the Trojans that came over with them to form found Rome. <clears throat> First, the Trojans came over. They confederated with the Latinum peoples. Two generations later, Rome was founded. A few generations after that, the Terusi are, um, I don't know if they were discovered then, but they were kind of annexed as a people and brought into being one people. And they also brought the Babylonian religion in its fullness to the Romans at that time. Beforehand, they just had some household idols and ancestor worship where, where they go to the catacombs and speak with the dead, familiar spirits or whatever, to get their marching orders. So it says, The Terusi and Ruoni shall reign over these with an iron yoke till the gateway of heaven be opened and the fetters of death be broke. Yet the land shall be filled with trouble, lamentation, weeping, and pain, though the Prince of Peace be born and lifted on high to reign. On the set-apart hills, for Sheba and Dedan shall overflow, and across the broad Euphrates the moon shall arise in woe. As blood shall it shine from the world's high roof to its western gate a crescent that never feels, and the star of peace shall it hate. So from Sheba in Dedan, it bore across the Euphrates like a moon arising in woe, a crescent moon that went all the way to the gates of the west, which you'd call the Pillars of Hercules there. What does that remind you of? I'll just say it, it's Islam. This is foretelling Islam 
and the rise of that. It says, a crescent that never fills and the star of Shalom shall it hate till the night be well nigh ended and ships come out of the west whose mouths are as stinging serpents and fires are within their breast, meaning engine operated boats with cannons and, and artillery, which is exactly what happened during the Great War where Islam was put an end to what revelation calls the battle of Armageddon or armageddon right this is also foretelling that it says uh when the mouths are stinging serpents and fires are within their breasts yet the messengers of el are with them the rolls of the law they bear they brought the good news the ruach of shalom is with them and the promise of shalom they share then Egypt shall be as water, yet now shall the nations rise, and the books be opened upon them, yea, even in all men's eyes, of wrath and the promise of Jacob, his sons be purged of their guilt, meaning that after that happened, then the books would be opened upon all of us, everyone would be able to have the good news, and then we can see the fulfillment of these promises and the wrath that have happened to turn from the evil that we've been doing, to repent of the sins of ourselves and our forefathers, right? But we have to know what they did that was messed up. So it says, <clears throat> And the books be opened upon them, yea, even in all men's eyes, of the wrath and the promise of Jacob, his sons be purged of their guilt. The ways of the king be open, and that house of our L be built. What the shepherd of Hermas calls the tower being built, right? That shall never henceforth be shaken. The, the li living temple not built with hands. These things be graved and set in the line by the clines of Pharaoh. Meaning all of this is actually written down in Egypt. If we could find it. Helms. 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 Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Kelms. Appreciate that. And that's for uh, pottery. Or not. One Kilms. more time. Helms. Helms. Yes. And that is for clay pottery and the like, where they put it in there to bake it and get it to be hard. It says, their place shall be hidden yet. Therewith is my story written, right here, right? And carved on the stone by the scribes are secrets of things which shall be and the names of 11 tribes, meaning where they are today, is written there, which I find fascinating. At the end of their days appointed, Right, So it says, our secret things which shall be, and the names of eleven tribes at the end of their days appointed. But Yahudah goes thither and fro as a lion stricken in the pit till the hour of the final woe. And we've covered that one before as well. But Yahudah, because they rejected the truth when our Mashiach came, and they said, we have no king but Caesar, they were given to the inclination of their heart until they say, Baruch, Bishem or Baruch Haba Bishem Yahuwah in regard to Yahuwah Yahushua, right? Until that happens, they're not, they will by no means see him again. That's the word. And right here, it mentions that they would be going to and fro until the hour of the final woe. When you look at Revelation, that third woe began at the Battle of Antietam. During the Civil War, 1862, 1863, right? Um, I think it's 1862, but the Battle of Antietam, that's when it began. And that woe um, was culminated, right? Or it was during this time, after 1862, that the Zionist movement was founded, the declaration to bring them back into the land, and those things were working for those purposes. Now, there's a lot of information about uh, Rothschilds and this and that. And 
I'm not discrediting anything that's valid that can be proven with multiple witnesses and is actually a fact. None of that changes his truth where he foretold what would be for the benefit of his people and what he is intending to do. Satan tries to corrupt and pervert, right? To kill, steal, and destroy with everything that he can. So we have to keep that in mind. But uh, we got one more in us, a little bit of time. Yeah. Give me just one moment because there's no more foretelling at this part, but it talks about how her sisters died and she was taken. Um, this is a narrative of her being taken to a place. So I don't, I don't want to discredit all that, but that's something for everyone else to read at some time. We want to get to, there's a foretelling that Yirmiyahu does for Rome. And I think I'd like to read that if I can, before we stop. There we go. So this is where she's anointed. <clears throat> we'll look at that real quick. Um, Ah, uh, it's the whole thing, huh? It says, we were five that rode upon asses or donkeys, and five by the mules they led, whereon were the things brought forth from the house of Yahuwah when we fled. The stone of Yaakob, our father, the seat wherein Yahuwah dwells, upon sacred things whereof the book of the foreteller tells. And the signs of my father Dawid, on whom was the promise stayed, bright as the crown of the dawn, deep as the midnight shade. Strong as the purpose of El, when he fashioned the land from the sea, a hope for the sons of Adam, that the chosen of him should be, a king over men forever, yea, unto Yahuwah's own day, meaning the seed of Dawid would perpetually reign over the children, which is his covenant, everlasting covenant he gave to him that he reedifies in Yirmiyahu, um, I think it's 31 and 33. It says, A king over men forever, yea, unto Yahuwah's own day, when the land shall be broken in dust and the sea shall vanish away. Upon me was that promise fallen. For me was the foreteller's toil. He had signed me with Dawid's signet, anointed mine head with oil. He had set mine hands to the harp. He had bidden me hold the spear. The buckler was girt to my bosom, and Baruch and he drew near, to set my feet upon Bethel, the stone that is seen this day. Jacob's pillow is another word for it that my seed may rest upon it wherever it is borne away. And its promise be sure beneath them, strong to uphold their throne. Though the builders cast it aside, it shall never be left alone. These things we did at Tafanes, ere we fled to the haven of ships, and the Ruach of El came on me. His promise rose to my lips. I spake, and I bade go forward, and the sons of Yahuwah obeyed, and the foreteller of El bowed down, and this was the song that I made. As a seed in the desert amongst thorns, I am fallen, I am blown by the wind. In your garden, in your pleasant field, beloved, is no water, is no rest that I may find. Bel hath broken down their cisterns and thy founts. Esau cast his sum upon you in your woe. Mitzrayim's night is as a darkness to be felt. Follow you with me the sum wherever it go. Follow after, follow after, my beloved. Follow after by the pathways of the deep. Le and here's another thing about that, right? With the crescent leading the sun that way, with it waning. That's just an allusion to it. You actually see it in her costume and her jewelry that she's wearing. 
<clears throat> this is follow after by the pathways of the deep. Leave the cloud of midnight thick upon this land. Go before the sun that rises out of sleep. Plant me far upon the far green hills. Ye have poured a living oil into mine heart. The waters of the sea shall gird me round. As the armor of the shield when I depart. My children hearken to a set-apart harp. As a certain sign of promise this shall be. The spear within my right hand will I keep. As the scepter of the billows of the sea and the lion of my signet is a sign <clears throat> and you can see that yeah you know, black haired heifer this is what she was known as the black haired heifer and her her uh signet was a lion so real quick we'll find the part yeah, this goes on for more, but this isn't what I wanted to talk about. The Malaysians are mentioned. Kiriath Hadathu. Kiriath Hadatho is Carthage. That's the the actual Hebrew name for Carthage. Okay. Basra is a sheepfold, but we're we're moving on because we're trying to get to a specific part before we have to go. And again, um all of this. I highly encourage you to read. There's a lot of stuff in here. It goes right in with scripture. It helps to comprehend some things. You can really see what was going on. Yeah, see? Nimrod, Asher, Edom, and Tyre. Why is the curse on them? Nimrod started mystery religions. He was the first magician, right? Or he, not, Cush was the first. Or sorry, Ham was the first magician, Cush got it from him, and Nimrod was a third generation, received it in bust, it says. But these were generational witchcraft that they used magic to delude people into hero worship. And that's what began the mystery religions. Asher enforced that with the sword. Edom adopted those things and was a foreshadow of what would come later. And Tyre was a type and picture of the paganized Hebrew that adopted that before Edom. So you can see these waves of that kind of thing all talking about the same issue and how they're cursed, right? But real quick, we'll definitely have to come back to this sometime because there's so much in here that's really worthwhile. Right here, though, chapter five. <clears throat> this is after they leave Carthage, they land at uh, Rome, not knowing where they are. And then they find a man and try to interrogate him. And what they find is Julius, the progenitor of the Julius line or family of Rome, which again was the was the uh, son of Zara that was the, the Caesars of what would be. It says, then men consulted together and marveled upon the spot. And Beoden, the son of Buki, was chosen of them by lot to lead our skiff to the shore and find of that folk thereby what hap had fallen upon us and whither our course should lie. Now Beoden brought us a man that was caught in a bushy field, on his head a brazen helmet, brass helmet, right? On his left arm a broad round shield, at his thigh a short stiff falchion, his feet were mired in the clay. It's that other mention. Okay. Like that statue with the miry clay. And this is typified in the person. While it was a son of Zara in that position mixed with that very thing. Could not be more literal. It says his feet were mired in the clay of the marsh where Beodin traced him and caught and brought him away. Now the man bent not towards us, but gazed with a steadfast eye on our engines of war and weapons, and spake no word of reply. Unto Buki, who spake all tongues, till the gaze of the foreteller fell upon him compelling and silent, and then he spake full well. 
in a tongue that the Scythians use, or the Sickens use. Sissons, I think that's supposed to be. I come from the she-wolf's hold, right? The she-wolf is Rome. If you don't remember, um, or if you don't know, the story behind the founding of Rome, Aeneas or Aeneas, the survivor from Troy, brought 80,000 people from the sacking of Troy over to Italy, and they were the paganized ones. They are the ones that had went corrupt beforehand and were the reason why the city was sacked. They joined with the, the Latinum people there, became in league with them, and then the leader, Aeneas, he ends up after the the uh, Lactinius's daughter is already engaged. He talks him into letting him fight for her. Kills the guy that, or you know, the, he fights and kills the guy that uh, was betrothed to her, and then takes her for himself. So he covets another. He's establishing things on blood. He's doing stuff that isn't beneficial, and you can see it playing out even in their children's children, to where Romulus kills his own brother Remus to found the city of Rome, the city founded in blood, which will later fall under a Romulus Augustus. So, but the wolf, the she-wolf is said to have suckled Romulus and Remus when they were young. And that's just, uh, it's a myth. But in reality, they, they call prostitutes she-wolves. So it's quite likely that their, their mother was a prostitute. Just so you know, which also is indicative of the negative things that were going on with the founding of that place. Contrary to the uh, truth given to the patriarchs already, and the reason why Satan took hold of it the way he did. He says, I come from the she-wolf's hold, nigh at hand on the, on the river, to seek a sheep of my fold. I am very wroth, ye phone, I am wroth with the son of Dan. This you foes, right? You enemies of mine, right? I am wroth with the son of Dan. I am wroth with all amongst you, save this damsel and aged man. Say for these I had not spoken. Avoid you the she-wolf's lair. Of the hill of the great day, Father, I say unto you, beware. Ah, oh, are you kidding? I'm going to have to find that one real quick. Sorry about that. I really want to read that to you, so... I need to get to page 27. I'll have the other one up here next time. I didn't know this was like that. So it goes, If your course be west, sell westward, whither I would not know. For the doors of Janus is wide, wherever I have will to go. If I find you, be you heedful. My sword blade is strong and short. And my shield as a wall before me, bind not or bind me not with the throng. Least the wolves in pack be upon you. Julius has many mates. That snarl in the lair, but howl as one from the tower or towers and gates. All right, and now it moves on. It says the servant of El stood silent, and gazed. In that strong man's face, with eyes like star filled sapphires, as he spake of his name and place, then bade his tongue be severed, that each before er, his thongs, his his he was tied up, right? Then bade his thongs be severed, that each before each might stand, eye upon eye, and we parted ourselves upon either hand. As the foreteller lifted his gaze to call down Baraka and curse, or blessing and curse, unto kindreds and peoples and times, better hap and to worse, or unto better hap and to worse. Whilst that chief stood silent, proud, in his eye the forward gleam of a shield on a wall that holds the sun with a steadfast beam. And here's Yeremi Yahoo's foretelling to him, okay? You are set in the night to watch. 
Our Mashiach said, night is coming where no man is able to work, right? And if you remember, he was killed at, in between the evenings. Okay. It says, thou art set in the night to watch. The towers of thy watch are seven. As a strong man armed, you shoot thy arrows at the highest heaven. And the arrows of a mighty man are his children in scripture. It's the, the children of the Romans. They have perpetual hatred with what they're doing. And I don't mean all Catholics. I'm not talking about Catholics in general. Most of our people are deceived. And he says, come out of them, right? But the ones doing this on purpose, they're the ones that we call the Nicolaitans, if you will. They're intentional about what they do. Says, I did not see you afar by the Basra or the sheepfold with long built walls. Sorry about that. Let me back up. Did not I see you afar by the sheepfold with long built walls? You bend three spears beneath it. Upon the latest it falls. Your swords are many and strong. Your quiver is full and wide. Your shafts are swiftly sped over all the plain of the bull. Yawin and Shatim are pierced. Greek, the, the Greeks and we call them Romans today, but the Latinum people that they, they took over and they amalgamated with, right? Yawin and Katim are pierced. Eber and Put are low. That Eber is right now by Spain. Okay, these are right next to right next to there, those aisles there. Lude and Aram are stricken before the strength of your bow. Ludim, Lud and Armenia, right there in the north of the Levant. Okay. Mitzrayim is yours, and the half of Gomer's bands, and the Gaal. And that's the entirety of the territory that Rome would, would get, okay? All shall be given your prey because you have cast down Baal. That might seem weird, but he's foretelling that all of this would happen and Rome would be given that position of prominence because in the Roman Empire, the paganism would be put down. And it was, they stopped the Baal worship and just faked it, right? But even then, it will be put down in this reign, the last kingdom to reign before our Mashiach rises up to fill the whole world. And it is a kingdom that will not yield its sovereignty to another, as we read in the book of Daniel. It says, on the silver wall of the islands, your farthest hunting shall be, which was Britain, they didn't, and they built the wall blocking off the Caledonians because it could not defeat them, right? On the silver wall of the islands, your farthest hunting shall be, ere the packs of the wolf are stayed by the dams of the stormy sea. War is your birthright, war is your joy, and warfare your bane. Shalom shall be very near you, and under you, shalom be slain, our Mashiach. In the street of the set-apart city, iron and brass and clay, you stand and shall be broken, your watchtowers be for a prey. To the beasts of the field and the fish of the sea and the fowls of the air. Um, that is seen, you can look in Revelation, he's going to destroy Rome with an earthquake that splits it into three. And then during the millennial reign, it's going to be a haunt of unclean beasts and habitation of, of uh, all the undesirable things. And that's when he says, look in the register, read the book, and not one of these will be missing. That's what's going to happen to Rome. He's already told us. <clears throat> Since thine helm is parted asunder, the crown of thy head left bare to the winds of the east and the north, out of Magog, Gomer, and Tor. With biting hell you are driven, 
your sword blade has lost its spur. In the lap of your wives, in the fullness of feasts, in the slavehood of power. The limits of where Rome was, and they couldn't go very far past them, right? And what caused them to have a downfall. If you were, you don't know, it was originally a monarchy. The seventh king had a son named Sixtus who took someone else's wife and raped her. And it was such an affront to the people that they did away with the monarchy. And that's when they became a republic, if you recall. That's when they started coming to prominence and power. Um, but just for context there, they eventually have, you know, illegitimate children running in the, the highest office of their country as a par for the course because of the way it was founded and its end. There's, there's no good that really comes out of that. You can have diamonds in the rough like Clement, but you have to, you have to separate yourself from all the things that are wrong, just like everyone else in this life. Great example for us to follow, though. So it says, um, In the lap of thy wives, in the fullness of feasts, in the slavehood of power, in your fetters of gold you are lost, yet there come a late hour. When swordless you rise again with a woman's cunning device, like that harlot with the golden cup in her hand, of tongue and snares of the eye, the souls of men to entice. By the name you hate at heart, you call the nations afar. The words in your mouth are honey, but as wormwood your actions are. This also long will I bear, till the goats be set from the sheep. Again, the condition that we have to do. Okay. For I set you a watch in the night, and this my watch shall you keep. These things he spake to Julius and bade him hide in his heart. The Baraka and cursing mingled and gave him favor or grace to depart. All right, and then it mentions that they go and they sell southward. Um, they continue on. And there is plenty more, but um like right here this would be an a foretelling for eber or what we'd call spain today where also tarshish is okay and it was originally called the iberian peninsula if you're familiar with that in antiquity iber is eber it's just hebrew it's another derivative of it another one is also avery or abri like avaris is the city of the hebrews if you didn't know, that was literally the name of Ramses, the uh, the city that came that was built afterwards, named by the Pharaoh later on. Um, when the children were in Egypt and they had that, they they named the, it was called Avaris or it was the city of the Hebrews. And then it was later changed. But um, I think that's all for now. There's plenty more in here. Uh, there's tons of stuff. Very, very worthwhile to look at because it helps to not only fill in the history of some things that you might not be familiar with. It definitely proves the foretellings and the fulfillment of them. It shows where literal descendants of the seeds of Abraham literally are, even to today. And not just in Britain, not just those that came to America, but it talks about Gad in Spain and heading to South America. It talks about Dan in Ireland. It talks about some of the others but they hadn't left yet. So um, very worthwhile to look at. I encourage everybody to do so. We might do so again if uh, Father willing and you all are so inclined. Until then, have a wonderful Shabbat, Shavuot Tov, rest of your week, and we will see you next time.